So it's a great pleasure to introduce Max Shu from Stanford University. Um, he's going to talk today for us about central limit theorems for random multiplicative functions. So Max, you can start at any time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, the organizer, uh, for having me here today and thank you for the nice introduction. So today I will talk about um, central limit theorem for random multiplicative functions. This is joint with the uh, Canon Sander Arjun. And uh, if you were at this uh, birthday conference for Andrew Granville this summer, then you might um, uh, have already seen a, a similar version of this talk by sound, uh, but that's slightly shorter version. So apologize for that. Um, so this is a photo of sound, if you haven't seen him before. So the talk of roughly, I will start with um, some general background about random memory function and mention some motivations and probably also mention some known results. Um, and uh, actually random memory function, I think it was started quite, uh, quite a while ago, but recent maybe 10 years or so, like many people actively stud study this um, object. And I'm pretty sure some of you have already seen this uh, uh, object like from some different um, talk or in your own research, but uh, I just uh, still will go through some basic definition of them and try to make sure everyone is uh, on the same page. And now we'll talk about uh, the main focus of this talk, basically putting some central limit theorems uh, for some random multiple function. And the, of course, that's not the only not the only interesting thing about uh, studying random memory function, but that's what will be the main talk, main focus of today's talk. And then I will uh, briefly mention some main tools and proof ideas um, about the main result. Okay, so random memory function originally, I guess it's uh, because it's a really good model for some natural arithmetic function like the real function, Mobius function, characters, and L values. Um, so because of this uh, great interest and people are interested to model this kind of deterministic arithmetic function by some random model. And uh, typically, usually people like study the following two models. And one is called Steinhaus random model function. So this is really a complex value function. So you decompose your n integer n by its uh, prime factor. And then, and then you correspondingly, you define your fn um, as a product for fp to the up i. And here, each fp is an independent random variable. So the key here is uh, like um, for different p, fp is uh, independent. And of course, fn in general will not be independent because F6 will be equal to F2 times F3, for example. Then obviously F6 will depend on both F2 and F3. So globally, it's actually a lot of dependency here, but individually for each different prime factor, it, they are independent. That's some feature of this, uh, just so you can see from the definition. Um, another model, is a random market random market function. This is a real value function. It defined on square free integer n. Again, you define your FP to be independent random variable taking value plus or minus one. And this is probability a half. And then you decompose your in integer n as a product of primes. And then you take Fn to be the product of FPI. Uh, here's some quick remarks uh, here. Here, why we restricted on this uh, square free, square free integer n? That I think it's just because originally people want to use this model to study Mobius function. So because a Mobius function mu is supported on square free integers, so it's a kind of a technical reason that we want also restrict on, you know, square free integers. But uh, you know, it, it's not a big problem, uh, and also. I, maybe I forgot to mention for Steinhaus case, it's a complex value. You can imagine that's all more, for, more like a good model to maybe 
um, to model characters, like directory characters, for example. So these are the two typical models people use to study. One is Steinhaus, one is Red Marker. Basically, one is for um, studying the um, real case and one is for, for, for complex case. Okay, that's the definition. Now, some basic properties you can immediately see from the definition is, uh, I guess for both models that first the mean is zero because you can really just by definition, you can decompose your know, FM by product of FPI, F, FP to the alpha I say, and then because each, each FP has mean zero, then um, the mean of FN will in general also has uh, mean zero. And here's also orthogonality. I put the FM bar here just in case you are talking about in Steinhaus case, but this should be true for both Steinhaus case and uh, Red Marker case. Because remember in Red Marker case, we, we force M and N are square free. So uh, there's some nice orthogonality that FM and FN conjugate when you take the expectation of them, it's, it's, it will always be zero unless M and N are equal to each other. Okay, this is the, the, the very basic property you can just immediately see from the definition. And the question we are interested in, in general is like, and the fundamental question we want to start understand is like, we want to understand the partial sum of Fn, say. Um, so, So we know that the mean is zero by the original, the, the last slide, we know that each Fn has a mean zero. So when you take the expectation, you can switch this order of uh, summation and uh, expectation, then you know that this quantity has a mean zero. And the virus is also easy to compute by the orthogonality. You can, can compute that the virus basically is a number of terms in your partial sum. So the virus of this quantity is basically x. And now from, from the, uh, most of the time in this talk, I just focus on Steinhaus case, which is usually slightly easier to, to, to describe. So the so virus is the number of terms in, uh, in this partial sum. And of course, I just mentioned like in spread amount of case, you just consider all the number of square free uh, numbers, but yeah. So from now, we just focus on Steinhaus case most of the time. Then a fundamental question and interesting question you want to understand is like, we know the partial sum has a virus X. If you normalize this uh, partial sum by its standard deviations, which is square root X, then do you believe that this will converge? This means it converge like in distribution. And here C N just sort of N zero one is like a normal distribution N. And C means, sorry, C means a complex value. Okay, so then the interesting question I want to understand is if this partial sum has a limiting, Gaussian limiting distribution as X and to infinity. And uh, I guess the, the probably the most impressive result along this line is uh, Harper's theorem. Harper proved that actually the L1 norm of us, uh, this partial sum will be something like square root X, but further normalized by something very strange. Like you probably not really expect something like this it would happen like log log X to the power of quarter. And this is sharp up to some constant. Okay. So actually this was original uh, conjecture by Helsen. I think Helsen is a, is a harmonic analyst he conjectured that this partial sum will be little o square root x. And for a long time, I think people were originally even tried to disprove this conjecture. You probably all believe that it should be square root x or something like that. But the, the, so Harper's theorem is really uh, like a great, like it's before he, pro he proved this theorem, really people don't really, you know, have a good idea this conjecture is true or false. So, is this true and for I, both scenarios for the Hada marker and? Uh... Yes, yes, that's a good question. Yes, it's true for both. 
And uh, as a query, this is the harvest result show that there's no central limit theorem with this uh, kind of normalization. So I also want to maybe quick brief mention that Harper originally, before this result, he had another paper already disproved this, uh, uh, show that there is no CRT. But uh, yeah, as a, this, this one is a just stronger version in some sense, in terms of uh, to prove it has CRT or not. So because the reason is that here is basic, like if you consider, So this implies that it converges into zero in L1 sense, right, basically, if you normalize by one over square root x. Then this partial sum will converge to zero in L1. And in particular, this will imply that it will converge in distribution. So this means that this quantity on the left-hand side will converge to zero in distribution in some sense. It's like it's a trivial distribution. So, so, so anyway, this is, this is a great theorem in this area. And before I move to talking about um, a central limit theorem, I want to, uh, that we can prove, I want to mention some other interesting result quickly, uh, just in case you haven't seen this before. So one interesting result in probability literature is like random walk. If you each time we take plus or minus one independently, let's say, so your x1, x2, x3 is like independent random walk. And then you expect maybe the typical value will be something like around square root n. But actually, if you want to understand the large fluctuation, say the limb soup of this uh, quantity actually can go to a little bit larger than square root n by something like square root log log n, more, more or less, OK? And this is for independent case, obviously. There's no dependency here. And then people can first try to understand what if for random uh, IM, IMF case. So for random IMF function, then if there's a lot of dependency. Can you really believe something similar to this will be true? And the answer is uh, following. So, so Harper proved that basically the lower bound will be something like square root x times something like log log x, but now the power is a quarter, not a half. And this answer a question of Halas earlier. So, so people believe uh, this result should be sharp. This, a quarter should be sharp. If you, if you still remember the result in the previous slides, there is a, this kind of typical value is like square root x divided by you know, log log x to a power quarter. So now if you really, again, renormalize by something like square root log log x, that it would exactly flip the, the log log x a quarter from the denominator to the numerator. So you really believe that this, this quantity should be, should, be, um, should be sharp, okay? And there's still, I think there's still no matching upper bound in general, although there are some nice work by, um, by a, a former student of Harper, Mastro Stefano. I think also he gave this talk in this uh, uh, seminar series, like maybe one or two years ago. Uh, he proved that the matching up bound is true, but now you restrict it to some subset, basically. Like if you consider all those n, I think he put the largest prime factor of n may be smaller. Okay, I think it's bigger than square root x. So if you Forget about those like smooth numbers, for example, more or less. Then if you restrict on this subset, this uh, uh, Master Stefano proved a uh, matching up bound. Okay, but in general, this uh, I think the up bound for this one is still open. And then finally, a quick mention something along this line is that low Tenenbaum and Wu prove that uh, almost surely you have this kind of uh, up bound. Okay, that's everything I just want to quickly mention about uh, law of iterative log logarithm. Um, maybe one more thing I can mention is, okay, um, I think I have time. I think one more thing I can mention is like, if, if you consider something slightly different, say, if you consider general polynomial phase, 
like say, I just randomly give an example, x squared plus one, maybe it should work. So any general polynomial, and actually as long as it's not degree one polynomial, and if you consider this uh, law of iterative logarithm, okay, something like this. And then we, we can prove this lower bound will be same, but now not a quarter, but a half. So this is really like uh, matching the independent case. This is the joint work with uh, uh, Corman Scredo earlier this year. So, so this is probably the, 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 we think the more interesting part of that paper. But uh, anyway, this is a, it's a one more result along this line. Like if you are interested in iterative logarithm, um, but that's will not be the main focus of uh, this talk. Now I, I want to move to proving central limit theorem. And usually when in probability literature, when people want to prove central limit theorem, uh, there's something called method of moments. So that means like you have uh, some, some random quantity, let's say you want to answer a distribution, maybe you first want to try to uh, understand the moments of the distribution um, of this quantity. Um, but in this random multiple function case, it's turns out usually if you want to use uh, mass of moments, usually it's not a good idea in general because it, the moments here always grow like very fast. Even, okay, if you look at the right-hand side, the x to the k should be something you, you really normalize, say, right? Like the, if you consider here, you're normalized by one over square root x, then the two case moments will give you x to the two k, so this, this guy go away. And really, but this, this really means that when you normalize by the, the obvious normalization, the, the moments are not going to be like some quantity, like a constant depending on K, but it has some extra quantity like log to the, some power. This poly log will tend to infinity as X tend to infinity. So these moments will blow up. So that means it has a larger moments than you want, which means that you cannot directly apply a moments, a method of moments to get anything like central limit theorem or whatever. And also, this doesn't really disprove that this quantity will not have central limit theorem. So, so I hope this this, this is logic. It's, it's like following. So, if you can prove this moment is bounded and uh, you know the matching the 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 Gaussian moment, then of course it has central limit theorem. And if you can prove it's bounded and not matching central limit theorem, and uh, not matching the Gaussian moment, then it's not has it does not have central limit. It does not have central limit theorem. But here it's like the moment is blown up. So it I basically tell you nothing about if you should believe central limit theorem or not for this case. So, so there are a lot of people, several groups in the last uh, 10 years or so study these moments for different range of uh, K, let's say two case moments, um, notably Heap, uh, Lind Lindquist, and also Harper, Nikbali, Rasweer, and later Harper, and they also probably like before them, I think uh, Granville Sound, they also have a paper, they use, they study these kind of moments, not that precise, but uh, maybe motivated those uh, group of people study this uh, uh, quantity. Uh, that's about the moments. And unfortunately we know it grows too fast. So you don't really want to use this in general to understand the, uh, the, the, central, the distribution, limiting distribution. Um, now, the question of the talk, for this talk, like we want to understand for what kind of subset. So if you take A to be one up to X, the full interval, we know that it does not have a central limit theorem when you normalize by one over the square root of the size of the set by Harper's result. But now the question for us is like, if we restrict, restrict ourselves to some subset, can we expect something like central limit theorem will appear? And this is uh, actually true for several examples. For example, trivially, you think I just take an A to the set of all primes. Now, obviously, you have central limit theorem because now each FP, F2, F3, F5, F7 
they all independent from each other. And literally this quantity here will just be sum of uh, IID. So of course, if sum of ID normalized by the standard deviation, it has converged to, you know, complex standard normal distribution, right? So, so that's just user CRT, of course. Okay, you can find a set. And can you find something like a set with some dependency? Because this trivial example really make everything independent. Can you find some example such that there's still a lot of dependency? And the literature is following, I summarized, some of the results. So the, um, the first result, I think uh, Hoff, it's also roughly 10 years ago, Hoff proved that for any fixed integer k, if you consider all those numbers such that it has k prime factors, then it has CLT. So for example, if you consider, let's say even consider k equal to two, that means all integers has exactly two prime factors. And that already certainly has some dependency. For example, F6, I guess it will depend on with F10, right? Because they both have a common um, divisor two. And in this case, Hoff proved that you have central limit theorem for any fixed K. And actually he, uh, the method he used is was like proving the, by using methodal moment. So that's give some limitation of how large K he could choose. And later, Hubble proved that actually you can extend k to any range like little o log log x. And if you still remember the conclusion from Erdos Keck theorem, for typical integer n up to x, it should have the around log log x prime factors. So k go to little o log log x will exactly capture the, it's like kind of like the boundary capture all those kind of not typical, right? Not to, not the typical integers. But this makes sense because by earlier result we saw in previous slide, if you consider all typical numbers, then it should it shouldn't have CLT. Right. So this is really in some sense this results are also sharp. And you can also consider model like uh, short intervals. If you consider x to x plus one in this kind of short interval, you might believe that in general, in short interval, there might be fewer dependencies. So, and indeed, uh, by this was uh, proved by, uh, I think, 2010, around that time, Chatterjee and Sun, they proved that as long as y equal to little o of x over log x, then you, sh you should have CRT. And the method they use is the Stein's method. So it's another somehow different method from method of moments. And, and uh, it's necessary to use something different from method of moments here, as again, we, sh we have seen from previous slides, the moment blow up very fast. Even in this short interval, in this range, the moments will, will blow up. So you really need to do something different and they use some Stein's method to prove um, the result for Y in this range. And one more example, uh, this was, uh, down uh, also in the paper I mentioned earlier with uh, Kluman and uh, Skratov, we proved that if you take your set A to be some polynomial values, and this polynomial has a mild and but also necessary condition, as long as the polynomial is really a degree two, at least degree two polynomial, then this has CRT. Okay, that's that's all the um, known. I think the, this more or less as known examples now exists in the uh, literature. Um, okay. So now I want to give some general criteria for CRT holds in this uh, IMF setting. And that's kind of should be viewed as the main result of this, uh, this paper is still not, not on archive yet. So, so we prove the following which hopefully using this criteria, you can, you know, prove more example for, for CL, uh, through CLT for more examples. So the theorem is following. So let's just focus on Steinhaus case for this talk. So we, we are interested in this kind of quantity with a normalization one over square root size of A and taking integer N to be in this uh, set A. And then, 
we needed the following, the following condition. The first condition is that we suppose we can find a set S such that A subtract S. So here is not the, the, the if, if I added the commentary list, I want to remind you here, I don't mean different set. I just mean A subtract. So it's more like this. It's more like A subtract S, okay? So the, the elements deleted from, uh, deleted by, delete, delete all those elements from S that it will be small. So basically S should be a very, has size very close to A, basically one plus little one. Okay. Then, then the second quantity, which is the main, main quantity we will be interested in is something like a multiple energy. We want to consider the, the solution to, 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 to equation like this, M1, M2 equal to N1, N2. We are each variable inside this set S. And we want to give an up one, basically two plus little one of the size of A, or let's say the size of S, because the size of A and S are roughly the same. But uh, you should immediately know that this equation has trivial diagonal solution. Like if we compare M1 equal to N1 or M1 equal to N2 and M2 equal to N1, M2 equal to N2, this gives you two times A square number of trivial solutions. So this quantity is really saying that the conditions ask you to say that the off diagonal solutions for this equation will be little o of the diagonal solution, little o number of diagonal solutions. So it's really negligible. Off diagonal solutions are negligible. And now for each prime p, we require this quantity that the number of uh, elements in the set S such that the largest prime equal to P will be also somehow negligible. This is actually a mild condition I will show immediately. So really you should just remember the, the red line more or less. Then basically we can show that the, the, if you're familiar with the probability literature, this is just the characteristic function of the random variable. We show that this uh, characteristic function looks like the characteristic function of Gaussian plus some error. So, okay, it's maybe looks a little bit complicated, but let me give a quicker remark. So the first remark, if the conclusions is actually better say the distribution of Z will be like a Gaussian, but absolutely small. So you let epsilon as small as possible. Then it, the distribution will be extreme, it will be close to Gaussian. So that means this line, if you dislike it, is this better saying it's a Gaussian? Okay. So, sorry, can you repeat what, what PN is? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I think I forgot to, yeah, earlier. So PN is the largest prime factor. The largest. Yeah, thanks. So the largest prime factor of uh, N, I call it PN. Okay. Now, the second condition, uh, the second one uh, remark, I just quickly uh, remind you um, that, okay, someone say PS. I, I... Okay, yeah, I should say PS, it's a typo. Okay, the second condition, so the condition about this uh, larger prime factor can be easily removed if you assume your A is large enough. So as long as the A is large enough, like this size, then this condition will be automatically negligible. negligible. This is some uh, estimation about some smooth numbers. So uh, I won't mention it here, but uh, more or less what you should, the takeaway is like, if your A set A is, is a large enough subset, you don't need to worry about this uh, largest prime factor condition. Okay, so really, now the, the three conditions really boil down to one key condition that is uh, counter off diagonal solutions to this equation with some clever chosen subset S. Okay, and this set, subset S we require to be density one, basically everything. You, you are allowed to delete some elements from A, but not too much. And then you want to understand the, the, the number of solution to this equation. And this usually, Call, people call multiplicative energy. Okay, so the game will be the following. 
you want to pick up a subset S with density one, such that this multiplicity energy is, you can control. And you have your flexibility to choose your favorite, um, your favorite subset S. So that's a game you want to play. Okay, as long as you can choose a, a subset S satisfy some condition for multiple energy, then you win. Okay, that would be the the, the main result, the criteria we, we, we want to show. Um, so, and the game is like you watch some, sometimes you want to choose S in a clever way. It's so, just a question, that, uh, another question. And so if, if, if you take A inside the set from one to N, what is like the largest A you can take? Is it of this uh, um, size? Okay, or? great, great, great. Uh, that's a good question. That would be actually be a theorem I want to present. Um, just a second, yeah, great. So some sample caption is first we use this criteria by choosing S in, in a way such that we can extend the original um, range of uh, uh, strategy and sound by from X over log X to something like X over log X to this power. I think this power should be something like a 0.4 or 0.39, something like this. Um, so the way we, we made this uh, improvement is because we choose S instead of consider the all whole set A, but we choose some, some special set S, we basically choose S to be all the typical integers in a sense, like according to others CAC. So it's like all the N such that is omega function taking roughly expected value, one plus two or one log log X. Then you can show that this S basically has density one. And then by using this choice, we have some, some advantage of a, a bounding multiple energy of this set S. So I give a quick, a quick uh, explanation and this, um, computation or, or, or strategy will also use these in some other examples. So maybe uh, we can take a look here. So the idea is very simple. You just have uh, this uh, equation. You just parameterize for M1, M2 equal to N1, N2 you parameterize in the following way. And now the idea is like for each G, H, A, B should be roughly speaking has a half log log X prime factors. Okay, because in total you have log log x prime factors, but this is unusual. Why is it unusual? Because if you imagine G and A, H and B, all four parameters roughly has size maybe, I don't know, square root x. And by others CAC, it's it, the typical, the, the, number of a prime, the number of prime factors, it should still be log log square root x, which is still roughly log log x. But now you only require something like half log log x. So this is something unusual. So you should expect you, you will gain some saving from here. But this is like a heuristic argument, like an intuition. But if you to make this, uh, what I said, precise is also very kind of standard. Uh, for example, there's a result of Shu by understanding mean value of multiple function. So, so this counting function, counting the number of solution, we can more or less say, we are counting the number of quadruple GHAB the valid GHAB satisfies some relation as you can see here. We are counting the number of uh, quadruple and you can bound by, bound, up bound this one by this quantity for any lambda bigger than one. The, the exponent is something strictly non-negative. Then you can have this up bound. And now this is true for any lambda. An important thing is now this quantity here will be some multiple function. You can use a lot of tools, for example, one result of shoe, then you apply the result to get some up bound depending on your lambda, and then you optimize your choice of lambda. And for this particular case, I can tell you roughly lambda should equal to two. So then you get what you want. So I I quickly uh, mention one si similar flavor, not similar flavor, but it's some related conjecture. I, I pretty particularly like it. I just quickly mentioned here is like, there's a, if you are interested in energy chemotorics. So Alex Rucha has a conjecture say for any set A of finite integers, if your sum set is bounded, then the product set will be at least a square over log A to this exactly power two log two minus one. 
It's too low to minus one, exactly the, the, the quantity in the previous slide. And this is not a coincidence because you basically can take your A to be all the typical integers that will kind of give you this quantity. So this, uh, this result, this conjecture if true is sharp. And I just quickly mentioned, we proved this for, with Yun Kun Zhou, we proved this for one A is dense subset of AP. But anyway, this is not relevant to this talk, but I just uh, want to mention this is two log two minus one is not something uh, very random. You know, It has some good arithmetic meaning. So I want to further mention some sample applications. So, uh, Based on our criteria, we can prove that you can also prove something like shift to primes. So you take your set A to be P plus one for prime P, and you, you, you do the estimate for the multi multiplicative energy, and then this will boil down to some uh, more or less standard C problems. So this is one more example. And some, another, some other examples, for example, um, you have seen that in this uh, short interval case, we don't really, we only get y to be something like in previous life, like x over log x to still some power c, let's say. That's for all set of elements in that short interval in this range. But now if we consider those elements in this short interval, but it's a prime factor has some particular structure than what happened. For example, you can see the sum of two squares, the more or less is saying that all your integer n will only have prime factor p congruent to one mod four. So that's roughly half, densely half prime factors, right? Your, your, your prime factors only coming from a set of prime with roughly density half. And then we can show that in this particular set A, the interesting is like now we can push the bound to something like uh, y go to little x. Okay. And this, of course, there's no particular reason why we pick up uh, P congruent to one mod four, like sum of two squares is not really special in this problem. And actually generally, as I mentioned, I said this density can be it as half, we can prove anything like density roughly one over two log two. So in particular, this implies sum of two squares will be a, a example if you want to push Y up to little X. One more example, I think someone in the audience asked about like how large A you can take to prove some CLT. I guess that's, I suppose that was your question and the answer is yes. So for this question, um, the best we can do now, if you normalize by one over square root A, the, the central limit theorem will hold if your A is around, can, can be the central limit can hold it when you choose your a roughly is this size. So it's n over log n to some theta and theta is a 0.04. So this theta is different from two log two minus one. Two log two minus one is much larger, is more like 0.39 or something. So uh, here theta is uh, much smaller and this theta should uh, ring a bell. Like this is really the theta coming from the famous multiplication table problem. That is the same theta. You forget about this uh, lower term if we don't care about it. So this, this data is coming from the multiplication table problem. And really the, even the proof is kind of similar in, in that direction. So, and a related result recently, I, maybe three or four years ago, Kevin Ford proved that he wanted to construct some set A such that as a subset of one up to N such that this uh, product set is large as possible. And he did some similar uh, argument we use here. So, um, yeah. So, so if we this is should more or less answer the, the the question from the audience that if you want to understand the largest A and with an obvious normalization, the answer is that more or less this is uh, the set A usually people pick up for multi multiplication table problem. Okay. And again, of course, by using our criteria, you just really want to compute like the largest, uh, the, sorry, the multiplication, multiplicative energy to bound the, 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 the set A. Okay, that, that's, that's some example we have seen. Now I want to move on some 
slightly more general criteria, which can produce some more examples. So this is the following result. We prove that instead of considering some, some subset, we now consider any general A and FN. A is some, some coefficients, let's say, any complex valued deterministic. So A is deterministic. Okay, this is deterministic. It's just some coefficient. For example, in particular, in previous uh, previous examples, if we have remember, we, we always have Fn. And in some set A, you can write it as sum of n up to capital N such that indication function and inside A, then Fn. So this uh, indicator function can be viewed as our special case of An, right? So if your AI is an indicator function, this covered the previous serum examples. And now we want to understand something like, if it's not an indicator function, what happens? Okay, so basically the proof actually more or less same. I just quickly uh, mentioned the results. It's like, if you have this quantity you want to understand, then now the virus is this, it's not just necessary N, it's basically a weighted version. And now you, you do the same thing. You want to cleverly pick up a set S such that the virus is compare is almost uh, uh, uh -huh. here. It should be and not in S. So it's similar. This condition is similar to the condition A minus S equal to little O. And then this is more or less the fourth moment estimates. And then you should get a CLT. Okay. So that's just uh, still keep the indicator function in mind, but uh, you should just believe me that some slightly general version also hold more or less without much work. And now with this new, a slightly more general criteria, we can prove something um, different from a slightly different, uh, like exa examples instead of uh, by an uh, indicator function here, we can consider about some additive twist. Okay, let's forget about first and more forget about this uh, or the condition here. We are interested in something like this. So we pick our a n to be something like e to the two pi i n theta. Okay, so a n is the deterministic. It depends on n, of course, a n, but um, theta is something fixed theta. Okay, so e n theta is something fixed, and f n is the Steinhaus random area function. Let's say. And then we can prove that this one has central limit theorem. Of course, not for all theta. For example, if theta equal to zero, this is basically one over square root n sum fn. We know this has no CLT by Hopper results, right? So of course, theta cannot be zero. And we prove that actually as long as theta is not too close to some rational numbers. This is a technical like um, condition. As long as theta is not very, very well approximated by some rational numbers, then we are fine. Okay, this is a, is a, a give me a theta, I check it, and then if you pass through this test, then this will have CRT. And particularly, for example, this is, uh, I give some quick remark first, for example, this. Uh, this um, Daventry condition is not too bad. Daventry approximation, approximation condition is not too bad. For example, it includes all algebraic irrationals. You can pick your theta to be pi, for example. And maybe last year or two years ago, Benita, Nishri, Rogers, they proved something like on average, if you consider average of all theta, then for almost all theta, the, you say that this will have CRT. And now our results is a stronger version. Basically, we give you a more or less like cr concrete criteria, like what kind of theta you should have CRT. And the earlier proved something like uh, almost all version. Okay. And then so I, I mentioned this like Harper's result, like as I mentioned, if you take a theta to be zero or something, like really close to be rational, then Harper's result tell you that actually there is no CRT. So, um, and if you are curious, what, what 
tools inside proof of this particular twist. And the general framework is same as applying our criteria, we bound in some material energy, and then it boils down to estimate some, some exponential sum with some multiplicative coefficients. And uh, perfectly, there's some tool exists in literature. This result by Montgomery Vaughan basically give you some upper bound on, on this sum of B and E and alpha when B and is a multiplicative, deterministic multiplicative function, okay? And there you have some, some saving, like rough saving is not too good, but it's good enough for our purpose, like uh, something like one over log X saving. And this capital I is depends on how good your definitive approximation property of alpha. So roughly speaking, your, your, you can consider I should be something around log X square, like say when you apply this here. Anyway, this is the tool and then apply our criteria, the, the, the proof follows. That's the main ingredient we use, additional ingredient we use. And now I really finally want to come back to how prove our criteria. Okay, so the, this is not first observed by, by our work. I mean, this is even going back to Harper. First, you really use this uh, nice, uh, this nice tool called Macklish Martingale Central Limit Theorem. This is really a, a, a structure random multifunction enjoys. Okay. So let me quickly um, give some idea of this uh, Macklish result. And by the way, the Macklish result originally in his paper, he's give a quality proof. So in our first coming paper, this was uh, with Sun, in our paper, we, we, we give a more quantity proof. So that's why in, in our criteria, we have some quantified version, but anyway, let me just very quickly explain the main idea about this uh, Martingale structure here. So the Martingale different sequence is the following. So if you have a random sequence of random variable, and then it's a Martingale different sequence is if, uh, for example, the first one, the expectation is zero. And also as long as you conditional on all the previous information, then you, Conditional expectation is zero. I will explain later why um, this applies to IMF case, but that's the definition. And then in order to understand the distribution, usually people just compute this uh, characteristic function and SN is the sum of uh, X1 up to XN. So this is SN is X1 plus, plus XN. And the characteristic function, a uh, Macklish established that this one is always close to this. This is exactly the characteristic function for Gaussian. So, so it's a Gaussian plus some arrow, as long as you can con control the later two big O. And the first big O is something like the maximum exp expectation of maximum of uh, Xn. And the second is uh, this quantity. Okay, but this usually max and minimum inside, it, it's not very easy to work with. So although it's so it's not easy to work with. So we will replace by some quantity like this, like the, something like the moment estimates. Okay. So that's why also in the criteria, this material energy show up because we replace this kind of quantity by, by some moments estimate. And th th this bound is also more or less easy to, to get by some trivial bound and plus some Cauchy Schwarz, I guess, or holder. And then um, Similarly, the second quantity also can be bound by something. If you expand this, this also looks like the, the force moments. Okay. I won't mention how to prove this, but uh, that's the idea uh, how, how, how this result will imply the, the, the material energy estimate somehow in our main criteria. But now I, instead of give a detailed proof of this one, I want to mention, quick mention some intuition. Why? where we use some Martingale structure. So let's see the heuristic. So this e to the i t x n, as long as x n is very small, we just do Taylor expansion, it will look like this. Okay, is e to the minus t square, something like this, times this blue lines, blue factor. And now if you multiply by all the summing x1, up, x2 up to x capital N, basically if you multiply them together, this quantity will be the product. Okay, so now if we know that this, uh, this quantity, you can view it as a normalized variance. 
if it's close to one, then this one will be exactly e to the minus t squared over two. So we only left with this uh, blue product. And now how we believe this guy should be something like one. Well, the, here we use the martingale intuition because if you plug in the martingale definition that this guy will be exactly something like one. So that's all heuristic intuition, why you should believe something like this will be true. And this is that we crucially uses a martingale structure of XM. Now I haven't told you why this uh, martingale structure appear in IMF, but I will do it now. But roughly speaking, if you believe it, you have a martingale structure, different structure than, you know, you, when you compute the carriers function, it seems very nice. Now, how to show this martingale structure in IMF? So, so there's a key decomposition usually people use a lot in IMF for partial sum of IMF. You have this partial sum, and your n is inside some set A, what do you do is do the following. You group them into several sums, but based on the largest prime factor of it, n, say. And then if you take your largest prime factor, then you consider all fn such that its largest prime factor is p. So pn is again, uh, remind you again, is like uh, the largest prime factor of n. So for this quantity, now, more or less this quantity will be our XP, like appear in Maclay's result. It's a, it's a random variable indexed by primes. And it's, a, it's a, now it's, XP itself now forms a Martingale different sequence. Okay, why? Because, you know, once you conditional on, once you conditional on small primes, then as long as you have P prime, let's say, P prime is larger than all the small primes you condition, then after P prime is kind of like, you know, if you take the expectation, you will get something like zero. So that's why you can, can check just literally by definition, this guy forms a martingale different sequence. So now the idea will be you apply the Maclay's results, even with the quantity version we had, like now, to this martingale different sequence, and more or less it boils down to understand some force moments. Okay, so that's why th this is a too big old term in in this uh, in this Maclay's central limit theorem. That there's too big old term, but more or less if you, you put them together, this roughly asks you to understand these off diagonal solutions of this uh, um, energy of, of of this energy equation. So that would be the main idea in this, why this Maclay central limit will apply to this, uh, 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 apply to our results. Um, yeah, this is about, uh, uh, this is about how Martingale structure in RMF. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's, that's most of the thing I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Max, for the nice talk. So we have time for questions. Uh, does anyone have a question? I have one, but uh, I wait for people uh, manifest about. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, so this, uh, in the previous slide, um, is this uh, XP road? Is this an exactly, or is this Martingale, or is this an approximate Martingale? It's exactly. Ah, okay. Martingale do sequence, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so, so you just, so now you just have to estimate those, those sort of energies in each. Yeah, yeah, so uh, much of the energy that it was, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, Let's see, and and the other question would be more or less so, sort of a like uh, more of a like abstract point of view. So you're always using this uh, Steinhaus uh, 
distribution. And I guess with um, how the marker would be the same. Is it, is it the same result? Okay, good question. So um, yes, in the Radamaka case, we can more or less for the similar results. We also have a criteria. Um, so for example, this multi energy condition where replaced by following condition, roughly speaking, would be something like M1, M2, M1, M2. Instead of like the product equal to the product, and now it's more like M1, M2 times M1, M2 equal to perfect square. So much of energy, let's say, like give a name, let's say square energy. So you want to estimate the square energy and uh, you can see that the diagonal or let's say trivial solution will be something like three times the, the size of S. So you really want to prove something like three pi liter or one S square. So three exactly matching the force moments of Gaussian distribution, real Gaussian, real Gaussian. So regular marker is real case, right? So real Gaussian exactly matching this three and this three is by, you can see the permutation of N1, N2. N1 could equal to N2, N1 could equal to M1, mm -hmm. N1. Yeah. So, so, so more or less this gives you the, uh, this is the main condition you need to check if you want to prove for a real case, or a market case. And all the rest more or less same, for example, the largest prime factor, that condition will be same. So it's really, yeah, the main difference really replaces the, 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 this guy by this guy. But sometimes it's easier. I mean, like for some example, it's easier, it's, it's easy, easy to estimate this guy because this guy not too much different, very similar to this, but it still has some small difference. So we didn't, in our paper, we didn't plan to work out all the example similar version, but we worked some of them, I guess. And, and my understanding was that like for the other market case, it's sort of a model for um, how a, like a, a real Dirichlet character behaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see and so if, if, if you want to model like a quadratic or a cubic, like if, is, did you explore and like uh, having a distribution which is like uniform over like the roots of unities, like the, the K root of unities and then you're trying to get some uh, yeah. So, so the answer is following. Yeah. If you if you consider some, we didn't we didn't do it in our paper. That's for sure. But I think some similar result can be proved established. It, as you said, like if you consider, uh, I guess, for example, you can see some some roots of unity, as you said, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, for example, in particular, yeah, this reminds me. I think Marco has a yeah, Marco has, a open, <laughs> has an open problem in his paper, asking yeah. some like random work on this, multiply random work on, on yeah. this largest point. So yeah, the, if you if you, I think, yeah, I, I think some central some central limit theorem, or even the hypothesis results, uh, one estimate for this model probably can be established, but Marco's problem is a harder. Yeah, it's a different one, but anyway, yes. For your question, is is yes should be some similar thing probably can be established, but you, yeah. you, of course you can boil down to some general criteria like some 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 energy type of result you need to estimate. But how hard it is probably it depends on exam model. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, because because you have like this results from two different distributions, and I was just wondering like like can you like choose you know, like Steinhaus over primes congruent to one model for and like how the marker over primes congruent to a three model yeah, for have... things like that. Yeah, I don't know. I, in principle, you can, you can establish the, the, the criteria, but then the condition you need to verify, I'm not sure how difficult mm -hmm. it is or how any yeah, good application. Okay, do, do we have more questions?
I'll ask a question. Um, so you mentioned that these moments blow up and you don't have, uh, that doesn't mean that you don't uh, necessarily have a central limit theorem. So what's the situation with, do you know what's the situation with moments to when, when you, have, you have this restricted case? Um, uh, do the moments blow up for, uh, for the cases in which you have established the central limit theorem? That's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. So the answer is, uh, I said, someone asked this question in another talk. The answer is uh, yes, it will still blow up in some cases. So even for the short interval, if you if you see that the trick we played in improving this result, I don't know where it is, now, but the, the trick we used here in, in improving this, uh, yeah, here. So if you see this trick here, we basically take this side of S and I'm, I'm trying to say from my memory is stupid. So if we consider n to be up to x, omega n to be still like one plus little one of x, then you consider the, 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 the two case moments, say, this guy. This is not necessarily x, but let's say in some certain suitable length of a short interval. I think this quantity will looks like x to the k, still blow up actually, unfortunately. So log x to the power, I think it's k log k minus k uh, plus one plus epsilon, something like this. So you can establish the, this is not too hard to establish, but anyway, I claim, okay. So you can establish some high moments of, uh, when you may have restrictive version, you can still prove something. And now if you see this still something tend to infinity, it still tends something, you know, blow up. So that's a good question. The answer is uh, no. So for, for your question is, uh, uh, even you have some, play this trick, but you still want to use a mass of moments, then the answer is no, you cannot succeed by just using mass of moments. But I have to say similar things, like the mass of moments is still interesting. Like, establishing this kind of moments is still interesting basically because it's a kind of counting some Daffentian equations. Um, I'm not particularly aware of any other application, but I think it's interesting itself, like a very interesting question to understand these Daffentian properties. So, um, so for example, uh, in Harper, he has a result about like a question about once your F is somehow fixed, you sample your F, but uh, you're moving your short interval. So you really your interval is a moving short interval. Your random come your interval, then you ask about some typical distribution of F re restricted on this short moving interval. And then by using that, by to understand some, some question along that line, there's a paper by Pandy, uh, Wang, Victor Wang, and myself. And we proved that basically we need to have to go back to to moments method. Okay. So so the point is like in general method moments is not very may not be the most useful tool for general random function correction, but in some some cases as long as your IMF structure is destroyed, here is considered more like typical F. So you don't really have an IMF, then probably mass of moments still kind of you know more or less uh, the, the uh, you know the standard way you want to establish something, and again I have to say this. I think this is a, also interesting. Daventian equation. This is a linear case, and you can also consider generalized to something like uh, polynomial products case. That's something um, Victor and I did, but not on our career. So it's like um, there are some interesting natural Daventian equation. Daffentian problem inspired by the moments computation of random multi function may not necessarily have direct application or, or could have direct application for, for a random multi function, but I think they are interesting themselves. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, I also want to ask uh, can, uh, can you say anything about randomizing the choice of A, like uh, the choice of the set A? The choice of set A? The choice of yeah, set, set A. Is uh, I mean, so you're restricting to A, a subset of the 
uh, one through x or one through n. And you assume that is deterministic or maybe in the yeah, yeah. language that of A of n. Yeah, you, so the sequence would be deterministic, but can you say anything about, you know, A of n also being random? Oh, you mean say like about the, the typical behavior that you would get lethal. among you mean yeah yeah i mean i mean that's this yeah. sort of corresponds to randomizing the choice of the set a right yeah 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 okay so okay like what's the typical behavior that you would get among okay. all possible subsets a or something like that Okay, he has some questions, he has some, some immediate thoughts for your question. First is, it uh, depends on what you want. Like if A is determined, so usually we, we are interested in some, maybe something more like respectic, meaning for example, one question inspired by we choose A and to be E and theta, Fn, this model is, for me, is more like, because there's a lot of interesting question about like, Kind of related to circle mass, so you want to understand something like the trace E and theta times, for example, Mobius million. Mm -hmm. Okay, that could be a good reason why we want to understand why your A is E and theta. So there's usually there's a good reason we want to, you know, to model something that number series interesting, for example, that would pick up those determinants A. And if you are asking about for general, more like if A is also kind of, I don't know, random itself, there will be another question like, you want your AN to be dependent on your IMF or not. That's a, that's a different question. So if it's independent, of course, yeah, I think it shouldn't be too hard. There's a lot of things you can say, but even dependent, I think if, if it's still probably, you can say something. So it's really dependent on what you want, like more concrete question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I have a question uh, that I fought some years ago. Uh, was uh, close related, but not entirely related. Is when okay when we sum over uh, subsets of of the natural numbers. Okay, just as you did. But I was interested in how far the L two norm can be from the L one norm. So we take the quotients from L two divided by L one, um, and I would uh -huh. like to know. How big this can can be the, this this question? So you think that uh, some some of your uh, approaches can give information about this, or how far the L two norm can be from the L one norm? So you restrict your uh, n to be in, in some subset? Yes, in a subset. Because if you sum over the natrons, you have the Harpers result, right? But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you want the, and you want say, to. In, yeah. in extreme okay. case, you can you can make the L1 norm equals to one. Say in uh, I, I don't remember correct what what was the subset, but some highly multiplicative structure set. You can make the L1 norm, and then uh, the second norm will, will be very large. But um, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I I, I think I more or less understand what you want to ask. Uh, it, yeah, it, I don't think isn't the L two norm just the size of it? The L two norm squared just the size of it? Uh, the L two norm is uh, I don't I don't understand. Isn't it just the size of a? Like, yeah, yes, the, the L two norm is going to be the size of a. So a. okay, so I I think if, let me see. Okay, yeah. Uh, for for Marco, your question. Uh, if I understand quite busy, you want to understand the L one norm of my use research on some subset array. Yes. Because uh, the L two norm is always clear. Yes, the the quotient between the L two divided by L one. Yeah, but there's busy S divided by L one. Let's say. Yes, yes, yes. Sure, sure. Um, I didn't directly try to understand this question, but I mean, more or less, you want to understand. Um, okay, maybe it depends on size as well. This L1 norm way restricted on some on some subset, let's say. And I think, for example, I did one competition is like when you restrict to your, like this, for example, that's one typical example. Like your S is some short interval. 
Mm -hmm. You can still establish some L1 norm estimates, like close to B sharp, I think, like along the line Harper did. So in some certain short interval, you can still establish like run through Harper's argument to get some bounds on L1. And that's also the reason, the reason I, I did that was because we want to understand how sharp this result is. Because you can directly apply Harper's result, say for certain range of Y, you definitely have no CLT because L, if L1 is small, right? But then the problem is like, can we really, you know, go through the, the, the proof of Harper give a much better understanding of this uh, L1 norm restricted on short interval. So mm -hmm. how you prove like something like uh, on short interval, it doesn't have CLT. You apply Harper's result for L1 norm for one up to X plus one, mine kind of take a difference one up to X plus one, and also consider the L1 norm from one up to X. Then you get some bond, like triangle inequality, you get some bond on L1 norm from X to X plus Y. That's like a trivial way you can do by using triangle inequality to get some upper bound on L1 norm from X to X plus one. But that, that true way will give you some range that no CLT will happen. But the point is like, can you really go through the details of how you know, machine reality to get a better L1 norm directly working on this instead of taking this kind of triangle inequality? That's the one thing we did before. And, and the answer is yes, in some range why you can do something. So that's further narrow down the optimal choice of this quantity. Oh, I didn't put it here, sorry, but 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 yes, if you have this kind of good structure, like short interval, I believe you can establish you have a good understanding of of of, of L1 norm. But again, depends on what you want. If your S is very, very strange, like uh, it could be something very strange happen, like you said L1 norm is very, very small or something. Yeah. Yeah. But along that, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. So, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I think that uh, we can uh, close now. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And.